Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Comorbidities 1 in Unit 2. So, we're going to start off by reviewing malnutrition and the risks entailed with malnutrition. And, um, really, malnutrition increases the risk of everything. Wounds of any type, and we'll be getting into those later. Infection, it appears to have a link to increased risk of dementia, increased risk of fractures, frailty syndrome, which... I have promised multiple times, and we are getting to it this time. Depression, uh, decrease in ADLs, which in and of itself is it's another risk that compounds, and of course, death if things go really poorly. So, what are we looking at here? Remember last time that, not last time, sorry, earlier in the course, uh, I mentioned that the elderly were a uh, disproportionately large strain on the healthcare system. And and this is a large part of why. If you look at the numbers here, excuse me, Mouse, go away. Um, remember, the comorbidity here is any condition or system that increases risk of poor health outcomes. 45% of all U.S. citizens have a comorbidity, one. The most common ones are hypertension and arthritis. Hypertension, I would assume, I believe is far and away the most common one. 92% of geriatric patients have at least one. So more than twice as many elderly patients have at least one comorbidity versus the rest of the United States. More than 50% have two. So again, more than the average of the entirety of the U.S. have two or more comorbidities. So why is this, right? Uh, you know, a large part of it's actually that it's a numbers game. The more days that somebody's hanging on to this mortal veil o tears, the more opportunities they have to develop something. And with the with more days involved, if they do develop something, we are much better at uh, therapeutic interventions that lead to higher survival rates. So there's yet more opportunities to develop something else. Also, the elderly are more at risk due to physiological changes. Uh, not not this one, unfortunately, I guess. Remember that uh, 41%, we discussed gastric atrophy earlier when we were discuss discussing protein. Gastric atrophy, atrophy boy. 41% almost of ger gerontological patients exhibit gastric atrophy. 12.5% 12, 12 intestinal metaplasia. 11% uh, present with xerostoma, xerostomia. I've heard it pronounced both. I think it's xerostomia is correct. Uh, almost 11% present with decreased sensations of hunger and thirst. And a whopping almost 55% of them decrease with some lean, decrease, present with some decreased lean body mass. Uh, here's, this is going to be the theme for today. And I apologize for these walls o text. But there's a lot of really good, um, references and sources, and I didn't want you to miss those, so I, I can't put them in in a sexy format. I couldn't figure out how, so we have wall of text occasionally. Sorry. All right, so we're going to discuss inflammation. I suppose when we're nearing the halfway point of a course on nutrition and geriatrics, it probably seems like an awkward time to tell you that we don't really understand why we age. I mean, don't get, me, don't get me wrong, right? We understand some of it. We understand kind of the process, telomeres, the shortening of the telomeres, the slowing down of the regeneration and replacement of cells that are lost or damaged. But why, though? We don't know what triggers this. Uh, the most common, the, the, the going hypothesis at the moment is inflammation, which is... One, a very witty and clever portmanteau, but also it's the chronic low-grade inflammation that develops due to extended oxidative stress as the body ages. It was first proposed by Francesi et al. as a network theory of aging. So aging and chronic disease. The action here, the proposed action is that uh, it's related to metabolic changes combined with oxidative stress. So the increased oxidative stress of just being alive leads to chronic inflammation. That chronic inflammation leads to higher susceptibility 
to chronic disease. The inflammation hypothesis is a one-two punch hypothesis. The first punch is uh, the chronic low-grade inflammation that mentioned in the last slide. And again, this is not something that, th this happens just by being alive. If you remember, cast your mind again back to uh, organic chemistry, uh, what is oxidative damage, right? It's rust, it's burning. That That's fast oxidative damage, but essentially due to the fact that we have to breathe oxygen and process it, we are kind of slowly rusting or burning, you could make the argument. This consistent, uh, in, consistent oxidative stress, excuse me, there we go, strains resources and it increases the susceptibility to illness or disease the same way that any kind of long-term inflammation increases your susceptibility to disease. So we're already stressed, already depleted. The second punch is some acute stressor and there isn't really a proposed since everybody ages, there must be some sort of universal stressor. And, and nobody has placed that yet. But it could be more than one thing. But eventually, it overloads the body's ability to respond, and it creates a pro-inflammatory catabolic environment. And at this point, the body is no longer able to achieve and maintain homeostasis. And this is kind of the official tipping point of aging, when people begin to physically deteriorate, if you will. Another wall of text. Sorry. Another thing that goes hand in hand with this is immunosenescence. Now, senescence just means biologically aging, and this can be a cell, a organic system, an organism. It's just biologically getting older. Immunosenescence is a term for the process of the deterioration of an individual's immune system as they age. Now, you'll notice with inflammaging and immunosenescence, the people that make these clever little words and the portmanteaus were on their game for this particular run. They were, they were ready. Now, there is debate as to whether immunosenescence is um, part of inflammaging, if it's just a factor of it, if it's a separate process but is linked in some way, or if it's at cross purposes. Um, by that, I mean, are there two separate things going on at the same time? as immunosenescence and inflammation, two different things at the same time, is immunosenescence, uh, some people have proposed that immunosenescence is what you would expect given a long amount of inflammation in the body. Again, inflammation does increase risk of disease and um, illness, and it may be that these just, that immunosenescence comes from inflammation. We're also going to discuss uh, wasting syndromes here. Uh, cachexia is the excessive weight loss in the presence of an ongoing disease. And it's important that's the real distinguishing factor of cachexia, is that it is, in, it is secondary to some other disease process. Present, uh, patients present with a significant loss of lean body mass. Initially, this is lean body mass. It is the muscle mass. It can progress to adipocytes if it is severe enough for long enough. The mechanism appears to be related to elevated cytokines, which is exactly what you'd expect given the state of inflammation, right? Remembering that your human nutrition and metabolism, all because I never forget. I know we always make jokes about we're going to just go to the end of the semester and dump everything. Don't dump everything. You need it later. The diagnostic signs and symptoms of cachexia are, again, an underlying disease condition of some sort. 10% weight loss within six months. That's for the diagnosis of it. Nobody, no care team is going to let this go for six months. They may not be able to officially call it cachexia, but they will call it protein calorie malnutrition and jump on it immediately. Or maybe adult failure to thrive or something like that. Um, oftentimes, people that are cachectic also present with anorexia. Remember, this is not anorexia nervosa. This is not the nervous disorder. This is simply a lack of appetite. So unfortunately, while they are, have some condition, while they're actively losing weight, they are also not interested in eating. The estimated intake on average 
is less than 20 kilocalories per kilogram uh, body weight. And remember, for older women, the recommended range can be within 18 to 20 kilocalories per kilogram. The difference here would be that other issue. And, uh, I always get the pointing wrong. There, there we go. That you also have someone having less than 20 calories per kilogram and they're losing weight. So if somebody is eating at 18 calories per kilogram range, I know that sounds shockingly low if you're not used to it. But if they're there, they're over 65, and they're doing okay, you know, their weight's stable, it's okay, it's fine. It's that both of them together, a low caloric intake plus a plus the weight loss. And this is, I feel like this is always very heavy, so enjoy the Jedi kittens for a minute. So noted cachectic conditions are uh, cancer, COPD or pneumonia, CKD, and age. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is a loss of lean body mass and function associated with aging. This is that disease, or not disease process, because aging isn't really a disease process, is it? This is the process of losing muscle mass that happens as you age. And I'm sorry to say that we all peak somewhere in our mid-20s to 30s, and then it's downhill. Unless you do something about it. And we'll get to that too. It, it, this is not inevitable that you can fight this. There's also sarcopenic obesity, which is, I mean, honestly, it's exactly what it sounds like in the tin. Uh, it's obesity with sarcopenia. Same thing as, as cachexia. Sarcopenia attacks a lean body mass first. That's the first thing that will become depleted. Then it may move on to adipocytes. So it's possible to have a high amount of body fat, actually have a BMI over 30, and you're losing muscle mass rapidly. Now, it's important to note here that sarcopenia, cachexia, malnutrition, and non-use atrophy, which is what happens when, when, when if you've ever had an injury that laid you up for a while and you couldn't get up and move around, and then you got to after, say, six or eight weeks, and that muscle was so weak and so painful, that's non-use atrophy. So that's different than sarcopenia. And sarcopenia is from aging. Non-use atrophy is non-use. Non so each of these four things are different. That's not to say that they are mutually exclusive, though. You can have a older patient that has some sort of, say, cancer. They can be sarcopenic and cachectic and malnourished and suffering from non-use atrophy all at the same time. All of this is possible. This is, this is why gerontology is such a fascinating field of study, at least to me. So sarcopenia risks. Sarcopenia is uh, it's one of the things that really, really keeps gerontologists up at night. It's, it's, a, it's a worrisome condition. Uh, it increases the risk of mortality, hypoglycemia, bone fractures, dehydration, and infection. More text for you. So why is that? I said earlier in some other lecture that lean body mass was a biologic sponge. And, and that's why, because um, lean body mass supports uh, immune function. It insulates bones from impact. So it, well, it, it, more muscle mass means less risk of injury or bone breakage while, when falling. It stores water and glycogen, so it helps control, regulate hydration. It helps regulate glycogen. So having a good store of lean body mass is really essential to long-term health, and especially long-term health in an older person. Frailty syndrome. We are here. I promised we were, gonna, we were coming to it. Here we are. Frailty syndrome is a cluster of symptoms in the elderly that present as chronic or with as chronic disease, physiological impairment, and abnormal hormonal function. It's diagnosed by the two common diagnosis, diagnostic matrices. 
the Linda Free John Hopkins Frailty Index and the uh, CGA Edmonton Frail Scale, they all measure the same domains, which is unintentional weight loss, exhaustion, muscle weakness, fatigue, nutritional adequacy or inadequacy, and slowness. Um, slowness is interesting. If you've ever been in a hospital or acute like rehab center and you've seen someone do the I get up and go test, which is someone sitting in a chair, how fast can they stand up, walk 30 feet, turn around, walk back, and then sit down again? Uh, it's an interesting one to watch. It's strange to see people doing that, but there you go. More, wor more wall of text. Okay, so what do, right? I'm not just going to leave you on a bummer note like that. Um, so, so here's the disappointing part or, or really good. Depends on your perspe perspective, I guess. The, um, remedy for this is really not, or at least the counteracting mechanism for this is really not very exciting. It's a uh, physical activity and healthful diet. I, I know I've just rocked your world with that. Uh, physical, physical activity has been shown to positively correlate to higher quality of life scores, both actual and perceived. And this is something that we're going to discuss later also. But there's the actual quality of life scores as far as someone's inability to do things. Can you walk by yourself? Can you bathe? Can you wash? Can you eat? These are the actual ones. Perceived is really such how do you feel? How healthy do you feel you are right now? And both of these are determinants to outcome, and they're independent. So there's the actual measured value of, of different quality of life scores. But also, there's just the how do you feel? Do you feel good? Do you feel healthy? Those two are independent of each other, but both of them lead to a better quality of life index. Also, a higher diet quality was linked to a better quality of life. And both of these are very, very strong. So actual, should note here, right, is more predictive. It's got a P of 0 0.001. But still, perceived as P, it's a P value of less than 0 0.03. So it is statistically significant. Just the way someone feels is, is statistically significant. And think about that in terms of older, frail sick people. So the way they feel impacts their outcome. And uh, higher diet quality intake had a p-value of 0 0.05. So all three of these are statistically significant. Um, what works uh, as far as exercise? Uh, exercise is dose mediated. More intense exercise does lead to better outcomes no matter what stage of life uh, a person is in more intense exercise equals better outcomes and cumulative time equals better outcomes. So the literature shows that it doesn't really matter how, how long an exercise session is itself. It matters how much total activity time does somebody get in. Um, now I w it was interesting to me to see when I was reading through this, that the younger a person is, the more effective high intensity exercise is but it is always a higher value than moderate intensity. Uh, interestingly, just in case you're curious, the other things that did predict outcome, better outcomes were uh, status of being married, a, what your income was, and uh, what level of education you had. So college was better, post-grad was better than that. So congratulations. Another thing that came out, and this came out fairly recently, as a fascinating idea to me. It goes back to that idea of intensive exercise is better. The uh, Lieberman, uh, Kistner, et al., they propose the active grandparent hypothesis, which states that people are designed to be more active as they age, not less, which is exactly the opposite of what we'd expect. I, I don't like design, that's why it's in quotes, and I honestly don't know that they said designed either at this point, but that the human body is not supposed to slow down. In fact, it's supposed to get more and more aggressively active as time goes on. Uh, this proposes that inactivity opens the door to chronic disease development and frailty. Slowly growing more frail and sick is not how aging is supposed to work in their mind, like, you know, so again, supposed to. 
but it's not what you, it's not what in their study with their proposal is that's not what the body is how it's supposed to work and if you see if you look in in the wild you do see that while older animals do slow down they don't really there is no right retirement for wolves or something like that they're physically active until they stop uh, this proposal was also backed by some sociologists that said that perhaps younger people were more focused on um, child rearing and uh, things around the, uh, the village would be exactly a settlement and that maybe older people were and gathering and hunting more they there's no as far as I know archaeology archaeological evidence to back this it is a fascinating idea though isn't it so what can be done about it? Well, as we said, physical activity and diet. And hey, good news. That's where you come in. Uh, RDNs can help. Adequate intake is related to healthy aging. And we'll go into this more later in a, later on in the course in another lecture. But it's not just like you can help. Dietitians are very very important as far as getting people to older people especially to change their habits um, they're more fo older people tend to be more focused on results and that is where you can come in and do something about it adequate intake is related to healthy aging and exercise physical activity is very beneficial in the elderly there are no two better income or outcomes predictors of outcomes there we go there are no two better predictors of outcomes than physical activity level and healthy diet. Also, by doing while I was doing this one, I realized that I have so so many Iron Man references in these things. I didn't know I was an Iron Man fan, but I guess there we are. Um. Well, moving on. So, what did we discuss today? Here, the elderly are at high risk of comorbidities. Remember, more than ninety percent have one. More than fifty percent have two or more. Age is by itself a comorbidity. Now, it doesn't count in that list of comorbidities because you don't, once you hit 65, boom, have one. You should, that's not what they're on the list for. But it does increase your risk of developing a comorbidity. How to combat it? The best two things to do are a healthy diet and a physical activity. The other thing the literature does show is that it's never too late to make that change. It's always effective going forward. It's always proactive. It's always, it will always, it's always beneficial. So no matter who you're working with, no matter how old they are, you always have the ability to help. As that is comorbidities one. I will catch you for comorbidities two. Have a good one. I'll see you later. Bye.